Hello and welcome back to our third session in the world, the world building series, A Window into Worlds. As we've progressed through this workshop, we've gotten from the general idea of world building and creating lore to a, the concept of building a universe and the world that is going to exist in that universe. And now we're on to city planning. We're just getting smaller as we go. We're getting into finer and finer details and getting more focused as we progress through this workshop. When we talk about our stories, it's basically like a play. We have a stage that we have set and that is our world. It is the foundation of everything that's gonna be happening. And every little bit of the watchtowers, of the cities, of the villages that we put in, those are the props. And we need a lot of those. We need the variety. And you need to have quite a few different options for your characters to take place in, especially if you're a dungeon master. You can't just say, there's just this one city, good luck. They want to go out and explore. That's the whole point of a pen and paper RPG. You want to get out there and explore the world that you're taking place in. On the map that we made in our last session, the example world that I created online, we had all these different types of environments. We had a desert, we had a grotto area, we had a ruined village that had gotten swallowed up by the ocean. And you want all these different places where your characters can explore. Even if you have a set story, they can still deviate from the path. You'd be surprised how many times your characters start to write themselves. So you have all these different options. You can have a set of ruins. Uh, there's lots of ruins if you're ever going to play a D&D &D game or something like that. There almost always is going to be an exploration of an old ruin. You've got lots of landmarks along the way. And when I say landmarks, I don't just mean special memorials or things that have been built by the people. There might be some other landmarks. Maybe there's a certain uh, mountain sh that is particularly large or it's cut a certain way and people recognize it people know what it is where you've got things like watchtowers and guard posts along the path or along the road if a city has a very close trade relationship with a little village they're very frequently gonna have guards along that road to make sure that trade goods make it safely from one place to the other and of course, if you're writing a high fantasy, you're going to have kingdoms and they're going to have lords and counts and a huge hierarchy of people that run different things. Unless you don't. Maybe in your fantasy it's a little bit different, and I completely encourage that. So why bother planning your city? To put it bluntly, you just don't want to lose yourself, and you don't want to lose your character. If your character enters a city for the first time, and the first thing they see is a temple, then you better make sure the temple is near the gates. You want to make sure that things are actually realistically placed as well. It's very easy to have your character moving from point A to point B and they get lost along the way. They don't necessarily know how they got lost because you don't actually know what your city looks like because you haven't planned it well. You need roads. <laughs> the first rendition of the major city that I put in my book series, I realized that there was a part where my character said she could see two separate buildings, but the position that she was in at the time, there's no way she could have. So it was pretty apparent to me that I had to make a plan of that city. I had to actually sketch it out and draw it immediately. So now to determine what kind of setting you need, what kind of city, what kind of place that you're going to need for your story and your campaign. Small settings are more intimate. They are where you're going to have uh, closer stories. You're going to have a focused event that happens there usually. They're great for single novels or a short campaign or a stepping stone to something bigger. If your characters are on their way to the capital of this country, this kingdom, then they're probably going to stop at a couple of villages along the way, stay in a room, stop at the tavern, maybe pick up a few side quests. If you walk around in Skyrim, you can't 
walk into a town without having about 400 side quests tossed at you, and that just sort of happens. As your characters move through the world, they're probably going to encounter some little things along the way. It might be something you'll need later, or it might be a great opportunity for backstory. Now if you're going to have a larger, grander story, you're going to probably have a bigger city. A lot of really great stories happen in New York because it's so huge and there's so many different nooks and crannies and alleys and businesses and underground places that no one's ever heard of and skyscrapers with penthouses and there's so much room to work with. You have an entire world in that little city. It's amazing how much can exist in a single setting like that. And these are the places where a lot of larger scale things happen. It is just a smaller part of village is a smaller part of a bigger picture but the city is really the sore thumb in that picture this might be either your goal it might be the end of the road or it might be the starting point it all depends on your story or your campaign the type of society that you have is how you determine what kind of setting you need. It's the same purpose if you can't put a square peg in a round hole. If you have an agricultural society, you shouldn't try and put it in a completely barren desert with no oases, no water. It's just not going to work. Agriculture needs a steady flow of water. They need somewhere with a good soil that they can plant. If you've got a hunter-gatherer, you need to put them somewhere they can hunt and gather. This is all really no-brain stuff, it seems like, but it's something that could very easily happen. And things might happen that cause these societies to change. A severe famine or drought or a plague upon the uh, farms, that society is not going to be agricultural or they're going to leave. It's just going to happen that way. That's how societies have changed over the years. If they're a society that domesticates animals, then you better have animals for them to domesticate and you better have some that can take care of the land. It's something that you need to provide and it's something that you can easily mess up, to put it gently. It's something that you might not think about all the time. And you might not think about how important these are to other societies. So, if you have a kingdom that has no farmland, there should probably be an agricultural community nearby that sells them grain and stocks them or pays it as a tax. There are certain aspects of a society that you really have to focus on. So what makes a city? If we look at the textbook definitions, there's a lot of different ones. but. This list is a pretty decent start. I don't always agree with everything about it, but it's something that I really wanted to put on here and have everybody look at. A big city, a, a good sized city that's not a little village, it's going to have a different size and density than somewhere that's outside of the city walls. And if you have a village that is a farming village, it's not going to have very many people. They probably just go into town to get supplies. So they're going to go to the city when they need more variety. You're also going to have that differentiation in population. This is where the specialists come in and we're going to talk about them later, but we're going to talk about people who are specific for a craft. Not everyone can grow their own food, so you're going to have to depend on others. There's also some sort of payment, because the only thing certain in life is death and taxes. And so you're going to have them. You're going to have to have some sort of funding, whether it is by contributing through money or some other currency, whether it's grain or something like that. It's, you've got to have some kind of city funding. Monumental public buildings. This could be a temple. This could be a town hall. It could be a guild hall if you have a crafting related society. Uh, these are things that are kind of essential to a town. If you go to a small town in the middle of nowhere, 
they're at least going to have a fire department, a police department, and a town hall, probably all in the same building because they don't have a lot of funding. And how your city gets that funding again is up to you, but there's going to be buildings that are provided by the city most of the time. So you have to figure out what they are and how they're getting their funding. Uh, number five, we repeat, those who don't produce their own food have to get support somehow. So just because they live in the city doesn't mean they don't eat. So they need to get food. It's probably bought from the king or given to the king as a tax from neighboring villages. And then it is distributed, sold, put in a storehouse. It depends on you and how you want to set up the system. They also have to have a system of recording and practical science. Now, science can be a really broad term when you think about your story setting. If you're taking place in a fantasy or in a sci-fi or something that has uh, magic, science and magic can kind of go hand in hand. So think about your magic system. Think about how they learn it and how they use it. And if it's sci-fi, maybe they have an amazing sort of technology that we don't have yet, and you have to think about how that's used too. A system of writing. Uh, you'll probably realize that not every society has always had a system of writing. Some of them have always been oral societies, that's up to you, uh, but it's really good to have a system of writing, to have some way of recording things. It's another element that you can put into your world that's pretty important. Now, I'm not telling you to make a language, but we are going to talk about that later. And I'm not going to talk about it in detail because that is a completely different fair and a completely different workshop <laughs> that I am not going to be doing. <clears throat> um, development of symbolic art. This, this can mean a lot of different things. It's not something that I have highlighted as being really necessary. I think it's great. I think it can encompass a lot of ideas, it can be related to religion, and faith, and it, it's something that you'll want to consider, and it just adds another level to your story. <clears throat> the trade and import of raw materials. This is really important because, I, I don't know if you've ever been to New York, but there are no coal mines there. Um, <laughs> you have a complete society that depends on other people, essentially. Most major cities have to depend on other places. Not everywhere has a diamond mine, so if you want diamonds, you have to go somewhere else. And not everywhere has fuel, so if you want fuel, you have to go somewhere else, obviously. That's why we have fuel shortages. You have to bring all these in, which means you have to have a good relationship with other people. Craftsmen. These are the special people who aren't a part of the major craft, and we're going to talk a whole lot about craftsmanship and apprentices and tradesmen, so we're going to go into that a little bit more later, but these are the people that are in the city and working. Now when it comes to molding your city, there's a lot of things that you have to think about. And the first thing that's going to come to mind is where did the city come from? People don't just make settlements and build walls uh, without a little bit of planning. And where did the people come from? You have to think about how your society formed. And there's a lot of different ways that that happens. It could be that there was a war. There was a rebellion and these people left one major city to go start another one. That's why you have multiples. Or maybe your city was invaded and that has changed the way that that city functions now. Originally it might have been a king that led that city, but then all of a sudden this invading city comes in, lays siege to the, uh, to the place and takes it over and now you have a new king or you become might have a count established and you now serve a lord of a king in some distant land. It all depends on the progress of your story and where the backstory is. 
It might be culturally formed. A lot of cities have started, countries have started, based off of the religion and the society and the way that that group works. Maybe they don't approve of the religious beliefs and the holidays and the taxes and they want to get away from that. So people leave and they go and they start their own society somewhere else. <coughs> or unfortunately catastrophe. It could be a plague. It could be a natural disaster. A tornado, say a volcano erupts, uh, earthquakes, and the city's completely decimated and there is no hope for rebuilding it. So people just give up, especially if they don't have a leader. So if, you're, if your president dies during some horrible, horrible natural disaster, the earth shakes and it opens up and it swallows the entire palace, what do you do? You become a refugee, you go somewhere else, or you settle in a smaller town. Okay, this next slide, I've got a URL here. I'll leave it on the screen for a bit. I, like I said, I've done this workshop several times with uh, my writing group and publicly, and I have a lot of different handouts that I do. So this is one that you can go online and get. You can just go to this website <clears throat> and you can find it there. This slide is gonna be a little overwhelming. It's completely full of information. But this is something that I use with an activity later on. Um, every time I did a class like this, I would have people draw a setting from the list that's getting ready to come up. And then I would have them draw a couple of things from descriptors and essential parts of a city. And then they would have to formulate transportation or a manufacturing industry or a utility service or a craftsman district or a tradesman that would be found in this city that they drew and there's a lot of variety and if you're kind of stuck on forming a, a place for your story to take place it might help. I've pretty much covered every society that I can think of. Um, you've got islands, you've got port towns, you've got uh, places underwater, underground, in a mountain, on a mountain, you've got a ghost town, that would be a great place for a story, you've got deserts, pretty much any kind of area that you can think of, you can put a city there. People are very adaptable, people are very clever. That's how we've lasted this long. So when you look over this list, it's, it's really big and overwhelming at first, but a lot of these are just places that you know every day. You, there's lots of mining towns. There's lots of little kitschy tourist traps, and you're going to see them pretty much everywhere you go. It just kind of depends on the area you're in. So this is an idea of places that your story could take place. Now when I say aspects of a city, that's pretty broad and there's a lot that it entails and I'm not going to lie, this is going to be um, another big slide. I have divided these up into four different categories and we've got a handout for them too. But when I had talk about aspects of a city, I talk about all of these different things and they're pretty overwhelming. Structurally you're gonna need all of these things to keep your city running. It's not gonna be perfect. It's not something that runs smoothly because it doesn't happen like that in real life. But we're talking structural, regional, economical, cultural. Those are the four categories that we're going to be discussing, and we're going to be talking about these in detail later, but I wanted to go ahead and put them out here as well. <clears throat> when I say structural, these are, like I said, essential. Your city is going to need some kind of government. 
who runs the government, how the government's enforced, it's completely up to you. And they're gonna need some kind of protection. These are essential things. That's what makes a city. So whether that, in that protection, that law enforcement is police, or whether it's a military, or some sort of religious organization, that's completely up to you. Religion, I listed it under structural as well, because like I said last time, faith, or the lack thereof, that is the basis for almost every city. The temple's the first thing that's built a lot of times. Sometimes there's a church. Sometimes people have a mass exodus because of a faith issue. It's really essential. And if your world is completely non-religious, that's fine, but they're probably going to focus on something else. So that's something you want to consider. Language, we already talked about oral and written. We'll discuss it a little bit more in detail next time. And education. There's been several societies that don't have schools. And a lot of them made it pretty well. Education doesn't necessarily mean going to a school and sitting at a desk and taking notes. Universities weren't exactly upheld and seen with uh, popular opinion in the past. It's something that they had to earn. So it's not necessarily about book learning. Because education in a lot of societies is about what you do with your hands. It's about your trade. Even now in America, if you have some kind of training with machinery or welding, you might get a job a lot easier than someone who's gone to college for four years or even people with a doctorate. These are people who are really in demand. We need them to keep our cities and our towns working properly. And of course, housing. You're going to have to have somewhere for your people. And the quality of life matters. If you have a poor quality of life, then that's your city. Your city is not going to be great. If your entire city has a very poor working class population is going to be reflected on the city's appearance and layout and everything. When I say regional, we're talking about the general geography, where this city is. If you have this city in a desert, that's going to really change the way this city functions. If you have it in a very lush uh, agricultural area, you're probably going to have a lot of rainfall that'll change the way things work that might be a different source of power for them. Where your city is, is it plays a big part in how it functions and holds up. And we're gonna talk about more of that later too. Okay, now we move on to the less tangible things. This is the economical and cultural aspects of your city. Your economical aspects, this is the businesses, is it a producer or a consumer society? Does your city exist in a manufacturing, industrial town? Does it exist somewhere with a bunch of shopping and service industries like restaurants? That affects how everything is going to work. Your medical treatment, you you have to have someone that can take care of your people. That's another part of the protection. Whether they're healed at the temple, whether you have a hospital, or maybe it's just some alchemist that has a little shop. Um, if you've got some kind of science fiction story, they may have some amazing technology that we don't have yet. You just go get in line, get a shot, you're on your way, you're feeling better. It's completely up to you how this sort of stuff works and how people deal with it. <clears throat> banking and currency, gotta have something, whether it's a barter system or if you want to have actual money, that's completely up to you. So it's something that you want to have at least an idea about, especially if there's a trade organization that you are working with. 
when I say trans uh, technology, um, obviously transportation is just how you get around. Is there some sort of public transportation? Is there a transportation long term that goes from city to city? Uh, your technology isn't necessarily cutting edge. It just depends on your, again, your story. It, all of this depends on your story. So once you have that straight, you can start working on things. And again, I can't stress enough, think about the type of community you have before you really establish this city and, and know how everything's going to work. The cultural aspects of a city is my personal favorite. I absolutely love adding different cultural aspects. I love talking about the foods they eat and the different holidays and festivals that they have. And I accidentally wrote racism into my book series. I, didn't even understand it until it was already happening. I had two characters that really hated each other and they were having an argument and all of a sudden one of them played a race card and I thought, oh my gosh, he hates him because of his race. And I didn't even think about it because in my mind they were fighting over something else completely. But it's a horrible, horrible issue that we have and it's going to exist in a lot of different societies. Sexism, maybe the people in your world um, venerate the women. Maybe the women are the most important of the society and they treat men like absolute trash. They are, they have four husbands and they take care of everything. And if you don't do what I say, you're out and they're not gonna be able to remarry. So you have to establish these things to add flavor and to add more interactions. <clears throat> Of course, we've got social classes. That's something that is going to exist all the time. Unfortunately, there's almost always going to be a discrepancy. And it's a lot of times not anything that you can do anything about. But these are the sort of things that really add to your story. As someone of a lower social class having to interact with someone of a higher place in society is always going to cause some friction, but it's also going to show a big difference in the way things are. But I love writing this stuff. This stuff is the really the blood pumping through the veins of your city, of your story, of everything. What they wear can always be really exciting if you're going to pull up uh, a lot of reference pictures and think of how things work with what events. Obviously, someone's not going to go to a masquerade ball dressed in what they would wear just anywhere. So you want to have all these different clothing options and food is going to be different at a festival than it is on your normal day. Of course, music and the different pastimes. I'm not sure why natural defenses and walls are there. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're a little bit lost. That was from the last slide. That's for your city structure. So this is kind of a breakdown of what we've already talked about. So I know it's a list. Man, I really like lists. But it's the best way to deliver this information a lot of times. We've already talked about banking and currency. If you're going to have a currency in a bank system, you probably should put some banks in there. Uh, medical, you've got your temples and your hospitals. We've got schools and libraries or as we're going to talk about a little bit later, uh, craftsmen and apprenticeship programs. You're going to have to have some kind of legal system. You're going to have, uh, you might have emergency services, maybe not. Depends on the type of society and environment and type of genre that you're writing in. Uh, government, we already talked about having a town hall. <clears throat> Lodging is probably the most important. Um, especially if you're writing something that's going to have characters traveling. Uh, whether they're just going to be staying at a inn and tavern, or they're going to be uh, staying at a hostel, some sort of place where they can lay their head down, even if it's the barracks and they're a traveling military party. You need to have somewhere they can rest and recuperate. Religious buildings we already talked about that. A lot of times you want to have a variety. Maybe there's not just one belief in that city. Maybe there are two different groups 
that occupy it and one is the dominant so they have a really nice big temple but the other one has a little shrine and of course if you're gonna have an industrial society you have to have something that is an industry whether it is a steel mill or a lumber mill or maybe they just have a water treatment plant there you're gonna have to have something to represent that society in the place uh, this is just a little list that I hand out with all of these of uh, older professions uh, this would be great for a high fantasy and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this of uh, where these people are gonna be in the city uh, whether you're gonna have a cobbler which is a shoemaker and repair uh, butchers and bakers uh, scribe these are people that really make up a city and are working there and are the lifeblood because you have to have some kind of income. So how do we organize everything? This is where we start getting a lot more options and where we start running into a little bit of uh, a struggle. It really depends on your society again. It depends on the type of genre you're writing in. It can be really easy if you're writing uh, modern because you live in a modern world so that might be a little bit more simple for you um, if you're someone who's had a lot of history classes or enjoy fantasies that might be easier for you it just kind of depends on what kind of world you're creating here one of the most popular city setups that ex has existed since the medieval times is the guild system. It's the one we see really frequently in high fantasy cities, big kingdoms. Um, you still see it in London and a lot of uh, the older European cities. This is where the city is completely built around the tradesmen and how they're set up. And they pretty much run the city. A great example of this that I, I like to use is Stormwind in the game World of Warcraft. If you've never played World of Warcraft, that's fine. I'm going to point some things out, but you can see Old Town on the map in the bottom right corner. Old Town is where you have the barracks, you have a lot of your military people, they are training, and because they're there, you have a lot of uh, we have a lot of people who sell and make armor. So as soon as you enter Old Town from the Trade District on your right, you've got a tanner. So you've got someone who's making leather armor. And right around the corner from him, you have someone who's selling uh, plate and mail armor and weaponry. Because it makes sense because that's where the barracks are. Those are the soldiers and that's what the soldiers need. When you go up into the Dwarven District, because Dwarves are Smiths, you have a lot more uh, blacksmith environment there. You also have the craftsmen, while the sellers are in Old Town, the actual craftsmen are in the Dwarven District, and they have shops there too, where they sell weapons and armor and supplies. <clears throat> the Mage Quarters in WoW, uh, if you've never played, the light armor people, the mages, wear cloth. So if you need a tailor, you go to the mage quarter. And of course, the trade district speaks for itself. That's where a lot of the trade goods are. That's where you're going to find um, a bowyer and you're going to find jewel crafters and things like that. This is how cities were set up. That's why if you look at London, you'll have uh, a lot of roads that are completely named after the craftsmen that were there and we already talked about how education isn't always about sitting in a classroom with a book and a pencil in an environment like this your education depends on the craft that you want to go into when places used a guild system a lot of times a parent would give up their child to go into that craft so if you want your child to learn to be a baker, they might go live with a baker. And the same thing goes with 
if you want them to be a blacksmith, they're going to train under a bra blacksmith and they're going to live with them. So you're just not going to have your kid for that amount of time. And this is how cities were built. You have a shoe street, you have uh, Baker Road, and that's how things were laid out. And you had people who made sense together. <coughs> this is um, modern city planning. We talk about either a grid plan or uh, uh, centric zones and things like that. A religious grid plan is an example of a city that has been built around religion. We already talked about how a lot of times the temple's the first thing is built, and Salt Lake City is a great example of that. This is an older city planning map that you can find online a lot of different places. Wikipedia has a few different examples of Salt Lake City. And you can see the very small grid area is the temple district. That's where the temple is. And they started planning out from there. These are, there's a lot of cities like this. And it just makes sense to have a grid in a lot of ways. That way you have your avenues running one way and your streets running another. And uh, we'll talk about on another example how businesses and manufacturers come up because of that. But Salt Lake City is a great example of how the temple is what they built around. <clears throat> you can see this is from actually from Google Maps and you can see that we still have these uh, grids where everything is based off of a grid layout. And it looks about the same as the city planning map. It's not much different. So we've got this sort of plan. Everything's built around faith, like we already talked about. Then we have this sort of grid plan. And this is based more off of manufacturing and transportation. The first thing that comes into the city is a mass job market. Uh, whatever that job market is, that depends on the area. Maybe it's a mill town, or maybe it's a big power plant that they build, and then they build around it. The example I used is a city I have to go to regularly, is Huntington, West Virginia. It's a grid, as you can see, but it's based around the railroads, because Huntington was established by one of the big four railroad tycoons and he basically built the city based upon the railroads. Obviously the tracks run from west to east and there's a lot of stopover points so the streets and tunnels were built because of it. We've got all these viaducts that go underneath the train tracks and at one point we had a trolley system and because we had this incredible railroad system. We had all these different ways of transporting and then we have a river that lines the town as well. We start having all these different factories come up. So now we have a steel mill and we have a company that produces paint and we have this lumber mill. We have all these different new manufacturers that came in because they know that they can push their merchandise by train and by barge on the river. So we have all these different businesses that come up and of course as they go in other places and demand gets lower and people start using planes and uh, semi-trucks, the railroad tends to lose its power which is why Huntington has lost hundreds and hundreds of jobs because the railroad isn't what it used to be, it's not what they need anymore and now they have all these other forms of transportation. Then we have this model, which a lot of people don't really like. Some people are like, oh, that's not a good city model. That doesn't even exist anywhere anymore. And they don't like it. And when you look at it, no, you shouldn't like it. It's not a great model. <laughs> it makes sense, but it causes issues. Uh, the concentric zone model is where a city sprouts up around a mass job market, again, but it radiates outward. Instead of people just kind of building around it and living down the street from where they work, you start to get this business district and then people start living on the outskirts. 
well, as you can see in this beautiful art piece that I've put together, in the center you have your central business district. That's where all the shopping is, that's where the restaurants are, that's where offices are. You've got lawyer offices and all these different people. And then around it, you start getting industry. You might have some factories and some larger warehouses and things like that. And then you start to get into areas where this blue is that change and transition zone. That's where you're starting to get out of city and into residential because they have a separate area. But then when we get into that pink area, the people who live on the outskirts of town, these are the people who can't really afford a car to drive in. These are the working class or the blue collar. These are the people who work themselves to death, work their fingers to the bone to provide for their family, and they can't really afford a vehicle, so they have to take public transportation. Maybe it is a subway, or a train, or a trolley, or maybe they just take a bus. It's the... and in a less modern society, these are the people who walk, and they walk here too. So it just depends on what access you have. And the further out you get, the more wealthy the society gets. That's why we have inner cities. This is why people want rid of this. This is why people are trying to escape it. Because you've got all these people in purple who have a lot of money. They're the people who own things and they can drive a very nice car into town, afford to park it, and afford the gas to get there. While these people in the pink, they can't do that. They have to walk. They have to take a bus. They have to find some other way. And then you've got the yellow, the residential people, who they can probably afford a car. Um, they might carpool because parking is expensive. But these are the people who come in and, and work 9 to 5. These are the people who come in and work but are able to do it with a little bit more peace of mind. So the next one we have rural industry, which is a really, really big society where I live. Um, you probably already guessed from earlier, I live in West Virginia. Um, no, it's not near a beach for people who don't know that West Virginia is its own state. Unfortunately, there are quite a few people out there like that. And this is a really something that hits home with us because we've grown up with it, depending on what part of West Virginia people have live in or it might have been to and even if you don't live in a coal community you hear about it all the time <clears throat> a rural industry area is a city that springs up because of a resource gathering industry if you've never heard of rocket boys or october sky um, i really recommend it it's something that has been forced down our throats <laughs> because we live here and it's pretty much the only thing that we've got going for us a lot of times so it's something that's kind of mandatory for us I'm, i think i had to watch october sky in high school and they made us read the book in elementary and they just keep talking about it and talking about it so to me this is just normal but to people outside of areas like this, we have no idea. Uh, it's not something that you really even think about. And I'm sure there's a lot of different communities that I have no idea about because I've never been there. Um, the example that I've got here is a coal community. Um, if you don't know anything about coal communities, they're ran by the company. They're a company town. and. If the company store doesn't have it, you don't need it. Or at least that's what they're going to tell you. Because you don't have another option. You're paid in scrip. You're not even paid in actual real money in these old places. They, they're still there, but um, they are no longer bound by the company rules. Um, but these people had a very strict way of life. If you grew up in a coal community, you were going to stay there, you were probably going to work in the mines, and that's what October Sky is about. It's about, um, I think, 
Jake Gyllenhaal, is that how you say his name? <laughs> That's um, who plays in it. And he's he doesn't want to work in the mines. He ends up having to at one point, but this is a true story for a lot of people. They don't want to work there, but they don't have any other choice. And if you've ever been to West Virginia, you can see we don't have a lot going for us. Um, like I said earlier, we lose hundreds of jobs, even in very large cities. So we really don't have a lot of options. <clears throat> um, you can see in the picture, uh, this is where it's being built. So this isn't super active, but this is about how they looked like. Everybody had the same house. Everybody shopped at the company store were very limited and a lot of times they had a horrible law enforcement that would come in it's something that if you don't know anything about I really encourage you to learn because it's awful <laughs> so I think this is the last one I don't have accurate notes because at the last minute I kind of added about five different slides so this is a very different organization I wanted to save it for last. This is a not something you normally see <laughs> and um, you can tell by the picture like mm, that doesn't look like a city and it's not but it's an organizational system that I wanted to talk about anyway because I have a feeling that you're very creative and you're clever and you can figure this out. A level system is not something that you're gonna find in a geography book but this is a city that is built in levels, obviously, where everything is self-sustaining. It's something that I've experimented with a lot, especially since I read the book High Rise, and I think it's really fascinating. If you haven't read the book High Rise or seen the movie, I, I, I'm not going to tell you I recommend it unless you're very keen on this and have uh, thick skin. I read the book because I saw the cast for the movie and thought I would really like to see that movie because I admit I am a sucker for Tom Hiddleston. But I, op I bought the book, didn't know anything about it. Bought the book, opened it, read the first line, and I thought, I don't think I want to read this book. And just to give you a heads up, the very first line has Tom Hiddleston's character cooking a dog on his balcony. So you can imagine how the rest of the book goes. Any horrible thing that could happen, does happen. And it seems like a crazy thing that I would reference, but it is so perfectly and so uniquely a world-building exercise. The whole time that you're reading that book, you think that it's the apocalypse. But outside world is completely just moving on its own. But the high-rise story takes place in, I think it's a 40-story building with a penthouse on top. The building is created by the architect, um, who I think is played by Jeremy Irons in the movie. And he's, he's an odd man, and he's very proud of what he's done. And because he's built this, he gets this wonderful penthouse on top. But as you can imagine, firstly, the building is built in certain ways. Um, one whole floor is nothing but shopping and you've got a floor that's got exercise rooms and a swimming pool you have a floor that has a daycare and a school essentially this building is built to where the residents of it never ever have to leave it is a city in one building in a 40-story building an entire city so it's really amazing how it's done and I'm I'm just constantly impressed as I went through the book with how it was put together and I was really just kind of amazed how at the end I realized well this is just world building this is a city that he's put in this place so it's a very unique model <clears throat> and I list Dante's Inferno too and that's the picture I chose partly because I couldn't find a picture of the high-rise blueprints um, but it's the exact same principle. There are levels of Dante's Hell, and each area, each level, each place, 
has people who have committed a certain crime. If you've never read Dante's Inferno, I really recommend it. And it's really interesting the way he places things. And it's the same principle of building on levels and combining everything that you need or everything that's there into an area. So to close, your city has a lot of moving parts and you want to keep it functioning. There's a lot of different things that you've got to have going on. You have your transportation, you have links that keep everything together. You want to think of it kind of like a clock. You've got all these different gears and these springs that keep everything functioning and moving and the little details of which we're going to talk about next time. But there's a couple of ones I really want to focus on and drive home because we've already talked about them but I've given you a lot of information and a lot of lists because I'm a list maker apparently. But these are the things that really, really matter. Location, location, location. We're a real estate agent now. This is what your city is going to completely rely on. You're going to have to consider your climate, the weather that exists there. Is it four seasons? Uh, we already talked about the different types of biomes and uh, the different types of forests. And that's something that you have to consider because you're place has to adapt. Are there defenses? Are there natural or are they constructed? Is there walls? Do they have access to resources? Uh, this picture is an ex excellent example. It's from Canada uh, that my friend sent me where everything's just encased in ice. I don't know about where you live but where I live we don't get as much snow and when it snows you might as well just quit because they don't have enough money to maintain the roads. They don't have enough uh, equipment to take care of things. So when it snows, we're just kind of stuck. Um, I usually have to dig out my car and I have a very short, stubby little car that doesn't deal well with ice. So my city where I live, um, whenever it snows, if the schools close, everyone closes <laughs> because they just can't bother to get out and do anything with the roads. So whether you live somewhere like that or you live somewhere like this, this is um, a, actually a swamp in Florida, um, but if you live in an area surrounded by wetlands, which I think I'm going to work on for the next uh, session, or if you live somewhere that's completely fat, flat and an uh, agricultural community, no matter which one you live in, you have to adapt to the climate, you have to construct defenses, and you have to have access to resources or to someone who does. And that's where your structure and your order comes in. You have to have that governing body and you have to um, determine how things are going to work, your hierarchy, your law enforcement, and you need these people to help organize your city, organize trade with other groups. They are going to protect you and make sure that you have everything you need to, lot to live. So everyone knows the essentials of life. You need food, you need water, you need shelter. Um, there are a lot of people who go without this. But even those people can rely on the help of others. So if your city has a very large homeless population, you should try and find a way to help them. Or if you just want a really corrupt city, I guess you could not have that at all, but the fact that they're in the city and they're not being thrown out means that there's at least some kind of protection for them. Uh, a communication system language, whether it's written or oral only, or both, uh, that's something that I encourage you to at least have a grasp on. And again, we're going to talk about language next week, but um, not in the detail that some people probably want me to do. <clears throat> a 
last thing, when you build your city, I want you to build it like a home because this is the most essential part of your world because this is where your, your story is going to take place, part of it at least. And you really need to have it solid. The foundation is the world that the city exists in. The type of society and the, the, the type of world, whether you're writing in a fantasy genre or science fiction or supernatural, well, whatever type of story you're writing, that's your foundation, the world that that story exists in. The flooring of your home, that's the society that lives in the city. That's who's actually occupying it. The beams and the supports, all those studs that you have to make sure are in the right place, that's the structure. That's the government, that's the law enforcement, the military, whatever you go with. That's what holds your city together and what keeps everything running smoothly and functioning. The walls and the roof, those are the necessities in life. That's what's essential. That's your food and your water and your shelter and how things work. The residential, residential area of your city, the quality of life, that's all of the necessities. That's what you need. The, so walls and a roof, that's the shelter, that's the roof over your head. And then lastly, everything else in your house, that's just everything else. That's all the little fine details. That's the decorations that you choose to put up. And that's what we're going to be talking about next time. So we did have some people join in late. So if anyone has any questions, I've mostly been talking to myself this entire time. So if you have any questions, now's a great time to ask them. Um, next time, like I said, we're going to be talking about all the little details. So we're going to be discussing language, timelines, history, science, magic, uh, education, uh, pretty much everything. And that's going to be our last session of this workshop. And after that, I'm always open for questions. You can always message me. Um, I gave my information at the beginning, but I'll probably try and remember to add it to the slideshow for next week as well. Um, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to message me on Twitter or by email. Um, I could probably put up my Discord information. Um, I'm happy to help. I get a lot of questions at my writing group. And I always tell them, you know what, just email me because <laughs> a lot of times I get a list. So um, I'm always happy to answer questions and I look forward to seeing you all next time when we talk about the details of making your world real. Have a great night.